remaining moments together. I want us to turn to 1 John to read a passage of Scripture with one another. And to ask you this morning, what is love? How do you define love? And why should we do it? I believe that we live in a world where the word love has been so confused and misused that most people have very little idea about what that word means. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be moving into a part of 1 John where he's going to help us understand what love truly is, and why we as believers should do it. This is an important thing for us, because Jesus has commanded that we love one another. Jesus has boiled down all of the commandments of God to love God with all that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. Without love, if I can paraphrase Paul, we have absolutely nothing. So it's important. That we understand what love truly is and that we understand why we should do it. That it's not simply an obligation. Last week I was reading an author who was complaining about chick flicks, I guess is what he called it. Uh, Romance, uh, books and movies, not the novels, not the the bad stuff, but just normal things that that, uh, the ladies like. He has a wife and several daughters, so he said he was very well acquainted with Jane Austen. And he made fun of Jane Austen, but because my wife loves Jane Austen and I like a happy wife, I'm not going to make fun of Jane Austen. But he made the point that a lot of these romantic stories end with the wedding day. With that wedding ceremony, or at least the moment afterwards when it's just the couple and they're, they're in blissful harmony and peace with each other. They're in love. But he said, what happens after that? They don't like to show what happens after the wedding ceremony when all the gross stuff comes out and you start to learn what it's like to live with another person or when all the sinful stuff comes out and all of a sudden people get divorced because they fall out of love. What happens to that story? We live in a day and age where love is a feeling and love is a an emotion. We live in a day and age where love is so wildly misunderstood that it's no wonder people are not passionately in love with Jesus because of the love of God that's been shown to us. So as we go to this passage in our time together, we're going to see what love is and we're going to begin to look at the true motivation that would drive us and inspire us to love one another as we have been so greatly loved by our Father. Please pray with me. Lord God, as we've had all of these different experiences this morning, these different ways that we are confronted with your love, whether it be through song or whether it be through the Lord's Supper or even a baby dedication. As as we have all of these different things that are confronting us with your love, we know that there is no greater power than the Word of God to change people's lives and their hearts. You speak and the worlds come into existence. You speak and life removes death. And so, Lord God, we ask, after all these wonderful things we've experienced, that you would make this the grandest moment in this service, that you, almighty God, would speak once again to your people. Remove the the frailties and the, the failures of the preacher, that your message might simply go forth and change our hearts. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John, the apostle of love, as he is sometimes called, is writing to his his congregation. Last week, or last time we talked about the testing of the spirits and 
discerning what is true and understanding that God's word is, is what gives us an understanding of who the true Jesus is so we know we're worshiping the true Jesus. But now he's moving forward in the letter and when he says something like beloved, as we see in verse 7, we see him kind of transitioning a little bit. And here he's transitioning to address further something he's already been talking about of loving one another. He says in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. I would planned for us to go a little bit further in this morning's text, but uh, there's too much here for us to pass by. This morning's text, these two verses begin and end with love, whether it's beloved or just the word love. It's this idea that John is beginning to broach about the love of God and how magnificent it is and what God has done for us and how that should inspire in us a great love for one another. John is not simply repeating the divine command from Jesus in John 13, love one another, new commandment I give you, that you love one another, that all the world will know you're my disciples by how you love one another. John has already written the gospel, he's already given that to the people. He's not simply repeating what he's already recorded that Jesus has told us. John at this point has been going through all of these chapters trying to help us understand how we can know that we are the children of God, that we know God, that we have been born of God, that we are His. And here he gets to what is perhaps the greatest test for Christians, whether you are true or not, and that is love. Beloved, let us love one another. He says, because love is from God... And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But he then says, everyone who loves God is born of God and knows God. Now, throughout this letter, we've seen those two terms used. Born of God, knows God. We've seen them used separately of those who have genuine salvific moments and that they are brought into a real relationship with Jesus Christ. When that happens and you surrender your heart to Jesus, you are born of God, a child of God. You now know God, not about God. And John here combines those two together in this letter to say the one who loves is the one who is born of God and knows God. That's how important love is is and it's not just a one-sided argument for him he says the one who does not love does not know God hear me the Christian who does not love is a liar and is lost in sin John it's not mince words here. The one who does not love God doesn't know him. Because God is love. God is love. Those three little words changes everything. When we grasp what they truly mean. God is love. It is part of his character. It is intrinsic to who he is to where if you are born of God, you will have love intrinsic to who you are. The being a child of God means that there are certain things that are passed down. When your parents had you, there are certain qualities that they passed down. Now, some of those qualities are optional. Some of those qualities don't necessarily get passed down. It's like the hair gene. It's not necessarily passed down to the child, which I'm very grateful for because my father is bald. So I'm very thankful that I'm not like my father in that way. But there are certain qualities of my father, aspects of who my father is, that I had no choice. It is part of who I am. It is my DNA that I am my father's son, and John is saying that love is so key to who God is that any true child of God will have that characteristic in them. And the lack of love and the deficiency of love and the complete absence of love in a person's heart demonstrates, no matter what they say, that God is not their father. If God is love... 
His children will love. This is why Jesus says all the world will know your mind by how you love one another. Why he breaks it down to love God and love neighbor because love is so much of who God is that you cannot be God's and not have some of it at least. I want you to note that John says God is love and not love is God. And this is very, very important for us in our day and age and our culture with how love is talked about. You turn on the, the TV or you, 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 you pick up the newspaper, you read about uh, loving activities. You, you, I mean, we have a culture that is just people are trying to stir you to be passionate about things with this concept of love, you have, um, you know, those commercials where the dogs and the cats, the little animals, are the most pathetic little creatures that, that ever existed. And they're trying to just stir your heartstrings to just love that animal so much to give, you, give them all of your money so that maybe they'll take care of that animal and rescue them. They, they're constantly trying to stir within us this, this loving desire. We have a culture that is all about love, a culture that is all about that word, but we have a culture that has magnified a false view of love and has sought to force God to fit into that false view of love to where they would say, love is God, but John doesn't say that. John says God is love. And this means that God is the one who defines what love is. God does not fit into a definition of love. This means that you cannot know love unless you know God. All that we have in this world and all that the unbelievers have in this world of what the concept of love, it's all a corrupted, perverted idea of what it is. Because you cannot know it without knowing God and you cannot exercise it without having God exercise His love in you. God is love, not the other way around. Which sometimes means that we need to change our definition of love to fit with who God is. You see, God is love, but the Bible is also very clear. God is holy. God is pure. God is just. God does not love sinful things. God does not love evil. The closest thing that God gets to loving sinful things is when he loved you and me. Which means that you and I cannot exercise godly love, true love, if we love evil things. Real love, true love, does not love evil things. This means you can have a couple who are wildly in love with each other and demanding the right to be together as wife and wife or husband and husband, or maybe let's take it a step back and, and not push that little button. And let's say you have a, a man and a woman who are wildly in love with each other and want to experience that love outside the confounds of marriage. That's not real love. It's not about some dramatic story that leads you to the wedding day, no matter how evil you may be up to that moment. That's not what real love is. Real love delights in what is pure. Real love delights in what is good. Real love delights in what is honorable. Real love delights in what is true. Because that's what God loves. And God is love. We've got to change our definition of love and our understanding of love. Love is not a feeling. Love is not an emotion. And love is not something that we must force God to believe in. We must change our beliefs about love to fit with who God is. And when we do that, when we understand that that's who our Father is, then we are motivated to love because of who He is. I am who I am. Because I am my father's son. There are some things that are given to me by birth. Just of who I am genetically. That I am my father's son. There are some things that are just by nurture. The faces I make. The jokes I think are funny. The mannerisms I do that Sherilyn thinks makes me look dorky. 
I watched my father do, and I wanted to be like my father when I was a little boy, and so I am my father's son. Shouldn't that not be true for our Heavenly Father? When people look at us, should they not see some resemblance of our Father who is in heaven? Should we not love because God is love? This means that we forgive people. Not out of obligation, not because the Bible says if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. And so we're like, oh, I don't want to go to hell. I must forgive. But we forgive people because God forgives people. And we want to be like our daddy. Should we not be willing to sacrifice who we are and what we have so that other people can be blessed and come to know Jesus as the Lord and Savior? I mean, after all, that's what our father did for us. We're going to read next week, sacrifice his only begotten son so that we could be his why do we love because our father loves and if we fail to grasp that and we fail to have that as our definition of love then we will continue to fail to reflect our father who is in heaven we're going to stop there in the next few weeks we're going to be talking about further motivations for love and further definition of love. But my encouragement to you this morning as we go into our invita invitation time is to ask yourself, what is love? I don't mean just some philosophical question. I mean genu genuinely, in your heart, in your mind, what do you think love is? And does it match with who God is? You know, if God is love, then wrath the wrath of God must be loving. If God is love, then the judgment of unrepentant sinners must be loving. If God is love, then all the evil that he has allowed to swirl around in this world and torment and destroy and devastate people for thousands of years must somehow be loving. If God is love, then he is love. So my invitation to you is to change your definition of love so that it matches with who God is. So that then you can go from this place and love as God has loved. Simply because that's who your father is. Let's pray. Father, the privilege we have to call you father is beyond comprehension. And so I humbly come and thank you for the honor that you have given us to be here in this place in your presence, to hear from your word, to partake of your supper, and to reflect upon your love for us. But Lord, all of this is or not if our hearts are hard towards you. If we have not love, we have nothing. So I pray for each one of us here. I pray for the person who's struggling with their own sins, struggling with surrender to your lordship and willingness to sacrifice, to do whatever it takes to live in the freedom you've given them. Please, Lord God, Work in their heart now to bring them to that place of surrender. I pray for the person here who's sitting here saying, I hope that person across the room is listening. Or, oh man, my neighbor really needs to hear this. Lord God, help us to be a people who look to our, the logs in our own eyes before we consider the specks in other people's eyes. Lord, I pray for the person here who fears what would happen to them if they died that today would be a day that they would find an assurance and a peace in you because you have become their Lord and Savior. Please, Lord God, as you work in our midst and as you move in our hearts and as you stir us to action to respond to what we have experienced today, I pray you will be glorified, that you will fill our hearts with a love for you and a passion for you, that we would go from this place and spend this week 
seeking to glorify you through how we live and seeking to love others because that's what you would do. Please, Father, make us look, act, talk, and be more like you. In your name I pray. Amen. So we go into our invitation song and I encourage you all to consider your definition of love. If there's something you need to deal with, sins you're struggling with, salvation that you need to find, I encourage you to come. I can pray with you here. Uh, we'll have a deacon in the back room who can spend some time talking with you and praying with you. What is love? If God is not your definition, change your definition. Please stay with me as we sing our song.